So welcome to the webinar on data warehouse modernization. We will do a first a short introduction round. Karsten, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, welcome also from my side uh, to today's webinar. Very briefly, Karsten Weichmann is my name. I'm working as a partner enablement lead here at Exasol. I'm looking forward to this uh, session today with you and uh, handing over to Peter. Thank you. Okay. So my name's uh, Peter Bellis. I'm working in the data warehousing area since the year 2000. I started in finance with classical Inman designs. I worked as well in telecommunications with Kimball designs. So went through different phases. I ended up with data vault. As soon as we started to create like agile data warehouses, we figured out the classical data modeling doesn't work that well for the new requirements, especially when we had the first projects with near real-time warehousing. And that's why I came to this whole data vault story. And I will be presenting more on the data vault part. We have Karsten here for the access hold part. And the main idea is that we first give you a very, very brief introduction in the products we're representing, but then we go into the topic about drivers for data warehouse modernization, what you should consider, what are topics that you should address. And then we give you some examples how we are addressing this kind of topics. So, Let's try to switch it. What is the data vault builder? For everybody that haven't heard before of it, it's a model-driven data warehouse automation tool. This means that we are bringing data modeling to a level where, that is very visual. We're trying to bring IT and business users together to create a business model of the company. In the background, we are generating all necessary technical objects. We're generating database tables, ETL and ELT flows, so that you don't need to take care of that. By this approach, we're making your data warehouse very agile, and we're making it well ready for continuous integration and continuous deployment. I will address it a little bit later. But for me, the main point of doing this is bringing really all the users in one company, IT and the business users together, because IT can profit a lot of the wisdom of the business users, the business user accept solutions better if they're involved from the beginning. So we are bringing in a tool set that helps you collaborate and create a solution together. At the end, this saves you time and costs. Where are we present? We start mainly in Europe. Our main development office is here in Zurich, Switzerland, where I'm located. In the meantime, we have grown as well to have clients and partners in the US and Canada, and as well in Australia and New Zealand. And if you're interested, either as potential client or partner, then I'm happy that you're following this webinar because we are selling our products mainly through partners to, to our clients. So welcome to everybody who is as well interested in becoming a partner. What are the data uh, the analysts that are monitoring the market saying about our tool? They compared us against many different tools as well from bigger companies like Oracle, like Informatica and uh, Microsoft SSIS, and they came up with the finding that we're top ranked in the category time to market. This means how fast can we bring new data sources to the data consumers within the company, but as well how cheap it is to change stuff that we have already implemented to get really in this agile working mode. You see as well product satisfaction was uh, valued a lot by our clients. And even if compared to tools like Pintao, we were judged as best price to value ratio because we are replacing a lot of different tools and we are as well making you faster and saving your resources. So I hand over to Carsten. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So <clears throat> what is Excel or why, why are we talking about Excel today as well? Um, as the topic is data warehouse automation, um, or modernization, not automation, modernization, sorry for that. Um, we present a, a tool that is that is exactly made for that. It's it's a data warehouse database or a data analytics database um, that has three main USPs that are also the reason why people are switching their legacy product over to Exasol. Um, and also why we make sense in the world of data wall to be used in combination with data wall builder. Uh, for one, it's the performance. 
uh, we are the fastest database in the world as we claim and as independent and audited benchmarks have proven. Um, we're easy to use. That means it's there's not much administration effort needed. You just take the database, put in your data, use Data Vault Builder, and we'll see that later how that works, um, and just start analyzing your data, uh, right? Um, without having to implement any administrative tasks, things like index creation or what all those nasty things that you, you know might know about. And the, the, the third one is the choice. The freedom of choice, independent of where you want to deploy your data warehouse, whether you're still working on premises, whether maybe you still need to be on premises, whether you're transitioning into the cloud, whether you want or need to set up maybe a hybrid scenario using both your on-premises um, infrastructure as some of the data has to be maybe to be kept on premises and some um, can be put into the cloud in order to benefit from the flexibility that you get there. Uh, we are there. We can be in both, in all three options, basically cloud, on-prem, and hybrid. And cloud also being public or private. We are available in the marketplaces of the big three big public cloud providers, but we can also, of course, run on, on, on a private cloud of, of any vendor. A quick um, about the company, uh, very briefly. Um, Actually, we're not that new to the market. Uh, we've been around quite a while now, um, more than 20 years. Um, we went public last year um, in, in the first half, late first half of last year. Um, and, but we have developed the, basically the product for 20 years now. Uh, we went to market with it in, in 2008. Um, we had a first customer or first customers in 2006 and 2007 already, but the real go-to-market started in 2008. And we've now grown out of you know, Germany, where we have our headquarter here in Germany, in Germany and Nuremberg, sorry, um, what's happening today, in Nuremberg um, to places like, um, we have offices in the UK and also offices in the US and we have uh, customers globally. So you, you saw Australia, for example, we have customers there in the US and all over Europe. But um, we're still basically grown, we've grown out of, out of Europe, out of Germany. Um, what is the technology? We're, we're the fastest, really. Um, it's an in-memory column restore analytics database running on a cluster of servers. Basically, all you, those attributes that you also have heard probably from others. Uh, that's just a modern architecture that's being used today. We've been using it for quite a while now. That means it's very mature. Uh, make sure you have a low TCO a quick ROI, and, and you can also do things like machine learning, AI, data science directly in the database. Operationalization, maybe you saw that on the, the other slide, I forgot to mention that. Operationalization of data science, bringing your models to the data, run your predictions directly in the database on the data, all that is possible with Exasol. To the right, you see some of the brands that are currently using Exasol, and it's just an extract, of course. Um, some of you, some of these might be uh, familiar to you, some not, um, depending on the region you're, you're coming from. But I guess it shows very well that we ha are, have, we are being deployed either as a, a kind of like an acceleration layer just to accelerate analytics in certain use cases, scenarios, or all the way down to entire enterprise data warehouses handling um, triple digit terabytes to petabytes of, of data uh, for these organizations. And also we have been looked at by analysts like Bark and uh, also Dresner. The, the Bark study, I didn't include it here just to keep it short. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there we scored top number one in 18 different categories um, actually. Um, and, and one thing that the Bark study shows showed and also the, the Dresner study that you see here showed is all of our customers, 100%, and in Dresner, the Dresner report it's a, for the fourth consecutive, consecutive year would recommend us. That means we, we have a very high customer satisfaction. Actually, in that Bark study, our support scored 9.9 .9 out of 10 points. We're currently looking into where we lost that 0.1 because that's we're customer obsessed. And as you can see on the right, we're pretty well uh, positioned there um, as, a, as a confidence leader, as a... As a uh, vendor credibility leader um, and in, in, in this quadrant of, of um, Dresner. Um, and I guess that, that speaks for itself. And, and those 
information that, that data is based on customer feedback, not on ours. So apparently we are doing something right in this space. Back to you, Peter. Good. So let's get back to the topic of this webinar. Which kind of drivers do we have for the data warehouse modernization? And if you look at the past projects that we did in the past time is that usually it starts with some current challenges. And one of the most clear is if you need to replace any end of life components, either could be that it's your database that you don't get any support anymore. It could be that your ETL tool will not be renewed anymore and you run into security issues if you don't refresh it. So this is a driver that needs that the does you make act anyways. But the question is, if you have such a situation or if you have just other issues, the question is how do you address it? So if you need to change anyway something because maybe you have end of life components or your current solution is too slow or your business users need to wait until they get any changes. One of the most important drivers to getting into such a solution with XSL and, and the data vault builder is what can I address at the same time? Because maybe I don't just replace the components, but I get some new functionality, or at the same time, I could reduce costs and complexity. So what we recommend is to look at in today's times is, can I become agile with the new solution? Especially if my problem was delivering fast in the past. Can I do quick adjustments? Can I as well introduce something like do move certain tasks to self-service BI that the end user can really check on themselves how the data should look like and maybe do some work themselves? So yes, that's nice for the IT department, but it's well nice for the business user because he gets instant feedback. He can try different versions and still do it in a controlled way that we bring it into an enterprise level data warehouse through a proper gate that the business user don't destroy any other parts of the solutions. Then for sure, auditability is a reason. Maybe you had it, but maybe you realized later that more of historization is necessary after you used your current solution. One of the important drivers right now is cloud nativeness. So can you bring this new solution into the cloud? But for me, always the question is, and, and Carson already addressed that, do I have the option to bring it back on-prem? Why? If I'm creating a data warehouse, my focus is not for the next year or the next two years, it's for five to 10 years or even longer. And I don't know what happens in this time. Here in Europe, we have legislation called GDPR, which forces us to, to take certain actions about data privacy. What happens if GDPR2 is released and it forces us to take any data back from the cloud? Is my solution capable of doing that? Or am I locked into the cloud because I have a software as a service which is not available offsite? And that's something that we are addressing here as well to say, yes, moving to the cloud can be favorable, but I should have the option in the next 10 years as well to, to revise my choice. More pressing is the choice between different cloud providers. What happens if in three years, Azure increases the prices or AWS does? Do I have the option to move between cloud providers or am I locked into one specific cloud provider and the tools that they're offering? So these are all considerations that you should maybe think about when you're choosing your solution. Always taken is for sure, if you get faster queries and that's where, where the XSL part comes in as well. What we find again and again is that in the current solutions, which were historically grown, so I'm not criticizing that, is that you have different places where the data is built by departments and you want to integrate it. And you want to have a plan how to integrate that. And you want to maybe make the cooperation better between business IT as well, especially if you go into agility, they need to cooperate, they need to work together so this is like a wish list and you should look at, so what are the current challenges, which of them you need to address and which of them would be just nice. The problem is with just nice features is if I try to address them without really pressing need, I could create a project which is more expensive than necessary. And here, and that's what we wanna look at is, can I by choosing a 
technical solution automatically address some of these topics without creating additional complexity, without creating additional costs. So they come like as additional feature that doesn't cost me anything because I need to move anyway for one of the reasons listed here. So let's have a look at why people are afraid of such kind of projects. And it starts with this. Let's assume this could be your existing solution and it's taken from a real project I worked on in 2006. You have it, maybe a data modeling tool, you have ETL parts, you have database parts coming in, you have some patterns for SCD type two historization, you have orchestration and scheduling tools, you're writing your documentation about your ETL and your database structures, and you use some tooling for deployments. And at the end, when you deploy everything to your database, you look at it, you do some data profiling, and usually go back to a drawing board. Now somebody comes and say, hey, please replace that with a better or newer solution, because one of these components here maybe is end of life. So some people just try to see, look at it and say, okay, how to replace exactly this component? And if you do that, then you end up exactly in the scenario where you will address exactly this need, but you will not create any added benefit. So you're just spending money on just getting the same as you had before. And here, this is the part where we try to address it by architectural change. And this is what we mean by saying, we try to make all of this easy by putting all of these different tasks. Then we had split over different tools into one tool. And this means by addressing this, going to a new architecture, I will address all the other topics at the same time. And this is probably why we came top here in the price to value category as well. But I will go a little bit more in the concrete use cases. So what are the processes if you talk about data warehouse modernization that I need to address if, and my assumption is if we're creating a modern architecture, we want to be able to work in an agile way and we want to be able to reach CSD, so do really fast deployments in a very controlled way, still following all, all the ITIL rules, proper auditing of the whole process. And usually if you start talking to people and they say, yes, automation could be one of the components for data warehouse modernization, usually they are looking at this part, model to code conversion. And it's a really important part. And I strongly believe that everybody that's doing that already made a big step forward compared to creating like manual ETL workflows or even scripting some parts of the data loads. So, what are we adding here? First thing is we strongly believe that visually modeling is a key, key part to success. Because if we have a very simple visual representation of our data models, which are business driven, we can talk to business users. And talking to business users means that we can unlock all the knowledge they have and they can help us to improve the models that we have. Second part is, yes, we need to generate the technical part. And there are a lot of tools doing that but we're doing it a little bit in a different way. Because as I say, our focus is on what happens in three, five, or even 10 years. We are not just generating in one time, but we are giving you updates. A very nice example use case that we had with, together with Exasol. Exasol last year upgraded from version six to version seven. They introduced new data types, especially for data vault modeling. And so we needed to change the technical model to make use of this new functionality our clients just upgraded to the newest Exasol version and the newest Data Vault Builder version. And automatically the models were updated. The new patterns were used for future objects. And the result was that the clients had the 3.8 times better performance than before without changing one line of code, just upgrading to the newest version of both tools. The next thing is if I have this in place, I need to be able as well to automate my infrastructure, to set up new databases, to set up new data vault builder instances, to maybe use some sandboxing approach. And here it is really nice that Exasol and the data vault builder offer as well Docker-based versions. So you can set up new sandboxes with just using a setup script that we deliver. And it takes you literally just a few minutes to start a complete new environment without any manual interaction with it. Next step is if you have your environment running and you have your code generated, you want to test it. And especially 
if you are now changing the focus from, from two years deployments into maybe six months, two months, and now we are down to two weeks with agility and now maybe one week, we need to execute regression tests without any manual work. And that's why we're offering APIs to set up a new environment, load the full model, create all the code that is necessary, load some test data, execute the data loads, and run some testing on top of it by using the APIs. And this is probably something that you figure out as soon as you created this year that this is really necessary as soon as you want to deploy two weekly or as some people do it already weekly with our tool or one of our clients is already get down to daily releases, which is possible if you have such an automated setup. Next thing is after you tested your code, you do the, did your regression test, you need to take care of deployment. Deployment means copying your code from your development box to test to production, maybe using even pre-production and production setup. And if you want to then use a Git flow based process, even creating sandboxes for your developers. And we have decided that there is a very good way to take care of deployment using versioning in Git. And we created our versioning mechanism in Git in a way that is compatible with how Java developers work. It means that I can branch and merge, merge our models. This means that if I have my integrated dev environment, I have two developers, both branch their model, developer A is creating his feature, developer B his feature, and this regarding who started first, you can decide in which order you merge the stuff back. You don't have any locks. You don't have any proprietary repositories. Everything is working on industry standards, Git. Git processes. Next step is if you manage to do this manually, you want to automate it. And again, there are APIs for that. And here we can go into CI CD and completely like using pipeline tools that, that are on the in the cloud area or using Jenkins to really set up a new environment and do everything, including deployment, and just use manual gates where you really want to like give sign-offs. But everything that can technically be automated is included in there. Next step is operations. How do you run your jobs as soon as you deploy them to production? And here again, you need to have some kind of scheduler. One is built in, but it offers as well APIs to use your enterprise scheduler. So it fits into your enterprise as well. What we are doing is automatically creating your master job. So you don't need to rearrange how, what the execution order is because based on the model, we can calculate the dependencies and do this for you as well parallelization of loads as data vault tour allows is covered here in this process. You're logging the results ensuring the whole operation and as well at the end we are offering high availability patterns so what can you do that your data is always accessible and in the next step what you need to do how you can load it at any point in time if you have near real time data streams. And the data vault builder is covering all of this process. And I will show it a little bit later how this works together with XSOL because most of the processes are relying as well on the XSOL foundation. So the first thing is how we bring IT and business users together. And the answer is by simplification. By simplification of the modeling approach. And even if we are called Data Vault Builder, we are not doing any data vault modeling together with our business users. We are talking about business models on a logical level. We even start with a conceptual level. So the first thing we ask them is, okay, let's look at your most important business process. What is it about? And in this example I have here, it was a company about ground handling. They told us their main business process is about flights. They're servicing flights at the airport. So we did put in this blue box on the screen. Then we talked and how does this relate to different things interacting with a flight and they told us that there are different functions of an airport, there are airlines involved, passengers, airplanes, caterers and ground handlers like themselves. And we, we did put the core business concepts here on the screen within the tool. But where is the difference to modeling this like in a separate tool is that it's linked directly with the technical implementation. While we're talking to the business users in the background, we're creating on the XSL layer in real time the objects that go with it. Then when we have the core uh, business concepts, we create relations between them. And this is all based on 
on business language. So they understand what we are doing. We are talking to them about what their daily work is and they understand what we are modeling here because it's not source system related. And then only in the next step, we will go after we finish the discussion with business users about maybe 10 to 5, 15 core business concepts. And we will change to a data-driven perspective and link our data sources to this business model. But everything happens in the background. So we are modeling here. And in the background, the technical implementation is happening by automation. So how automation reduce delivery times and make it future-proof? Because these are two different aspects. The first thing is, how long does it take to create your first solution? And this is maybe what most people look at. So if I just want to bring the data into my data vault, maybe in my raw vault, I could create a small script and it will work. Let's be honest. You can create like a small metadata store in Excel. You create a script and you create your first data flows. But later on, you recognize that it was maybe not the best solution because you did it the first time. So you create your scripts again and you create a better technical implementation. And again, and again. At some point you arrive here at a very nice design. But the people realize that they need to code again and again and change their code bases on their own because they figure out there are more requirements like implicit deletes in the data source, like historization needs to be handled like uh, race conditions in parallel loading, stuff like that. And you need to solve every problem yourself. And some, PMs, some people came up and say, yes, but that, that's manual coding. That's, that's not fair. Let's compare it with um, ETL tools. But ETL tools is the same. It's even worse. You're creating then everything just by point and clicking. You're creating a concrete technical implementation. Automation is about capturing what is your target, like maybe washing your hands and generating over time again and again better solutions. And this is exactly the case that I mentioned before. It's like version six and version seven of Exasol. Yes, the database improved a lot. There is better optimization of the, of the parser. There are new data types and stuff like that. But again, we needed to recompile our logical model to the technical model to make use of this. And in our case, the requirements, this is what the model is about. And this means that if you're working on this layer, which stays pretty stable as long as your business stays stable, you can regenerate better versions over the time. And if I say better over the time, I mean really put the focus on in three, in five, or in 10 years. Why are we doing that? Yes, you're saving a lot of time. You're saving time while generating the loads into our core data warehouse. But as well, we are creating visually the interfaces for selecting from our core warehouse. And that's especially if you're building a data vault core, really important because there are so many joints to do that you need to automate that. Next things we're automating as well is the documentation of everything, generation of the data lineage, but as well master job creation. So in which order the the different loads can happen, automating as well the deployment, automating testing. So all over through the whole process, the automation tool that is covering the full process will help you to save time and effort. Now, if you say, how can we bring in the business users as well? How can we enable them later to do some of the IT work? And it's not only because just we want to push away our work, but we want to enable them to get results faster and maybe to see different versions interactively what they're doing. So they are happy as well because they have a benefit of it to modify some interface themselves. And yes, we are not allowing them to do this on our production server. We're giving them a sandbox. In the sandbox, they can create what they need. They will put this in a proper deployment process through Git. There's a gatekeeper on the IT side checking if this makes sense. So it's a proper, proper ITIL conform process, but at least in the first version on their sandbox, they get very fast results. So if they need additional columns, they need to join certain stuff together into their conform dimension or conform fact table. This is possible to enable some power users. Yeah, let's be honest, not every report user or report creator will likes to be involved in this kind of process, but the power users and report creators which are really advanced and know exactly what data modeling is, they will really be happy about having the opportunity to help here out, but at the same time, 
to get faster and get exactly what they need. And so, by the way, I forgot to say, this is the module where we're creating and selecting data either for a dimensional model, but it could be as well for certain companies that they're creating completely flat table, if like the recipients are data scientists, or we have a more normalized model if you're using tools like maybe Cognos or some business object, but we're always creating an interface to the data world in a more or less denormalized fashion because that's one of the downsides of a data world approach that on the technical level, you get a lot of physical database objects, but the good thing is you can automate it, the selection, so you don't need to worry about it if you have an interface builder in such a nice format as we have it here. Let's talk about deployment options. I already talked a little bit about it, but for Exasol and for us, we give you the complete option where you want to deploy your software, which version you're running. If you have it in your private cloud, then you don't need to worry that anybody can access it. Or if you have more requirements to put it in a public cloud that somebody's operating the service for you in the case of Exasol, that's everything fine. But we give you the choice to control everything because we have a lot of clients that at the end of year don't want to get any updates, even if you're releasing at least monthly releases with new features and security updates. But they say, okay, end of year, we are skipping this release and we're going forward. And so some people came up and say, yeah, but you could offer software as a service thing that just skips the end of year. Yeah, that would be cool, but if everybody would be in the same region, but our Australian friends and New Zealand is doing like this in the mid of year. So we would need to have already two kinds of windows where we don't do any updates and stuff like that. So that's why we decided that it's on purpose that we give you the full control and you run the software under your control and you don't need to be worried that somebody's taking some features from your way in five or 10 years because it's not paying off for them to provide such kind of a service. Integrating models. And this goes uh, in, into the topic of data, uh, data silos. So, and it's not like that it will not happen ever again, but our approach is that we can do a model driven integration. So let's assume that we have two different departments and they start to build their data model at two different, different end of the organization. By having a standardized approach, by having the possibility to, to merge the models through the Git process, it's just not a problem anymore. So one, uh, one department can create their own topics, another one their topics, and as soon as they start to use the same elements and connect through the same points, we can use the Git process to integrate it and bring it into a central model. So instead of trying to bring everybody to, to one table and force them to work together already from the beginning, we just align them on how the process works. They can do their work, they can follow their own deployment cycles. We just enable them at the end to create one integrated data view. And the good thing is as soon as they get the integrated model back, they can all profit from it and continue expanding it to their needs. And this is, as you know, probably that the network theory that the bigger this kind of network goes, it exponentially becomes more valuable. So in the beginning, if I'm creating my data wall just with two hubs and the link, most probably I don't have a big benefit, but the more I'm modeling into it, the bigger it gets. But where does it stop? Because we talk now about the data warehouse, but at the end, I don't want to create a data warehouse. I want to create some output and one of the most common output is creating a report. And if I'm creating the data warehouse based on a model driven perspective, I can export my metadata into my report tool. I have here example with click and that's just because it's the only tool I know how to use because it's a long time since I did reports, but it works exactly as well for Power BI. It works as well for Tableau. It works for, for all the modern reporting tools, but as well, including sub business object, Cognos, whatever you want to do. As the metadata is given, and I can discover through the metadata what the data model is, we don't need to write any manual load scripts in the report tools. We can just select from the objects that were created by the data warehouse and published, and our data model is created automatically within the reporting tool. This means that I'm taking as well here complexity away from the report builders. I'm ensuring that all the reports 
are based on the same logic. And I make it simpler for my business users in the direction of self-service BI to create their own small report just by selecting out of the object and the stuff that can be connected is connected correctly based on the proper naming scheme. So this is a little bit the perspective that we have. So we have from infrastructure to deployment on one axis on the technical thing. The second thing is going through all the layers up to the report and cover everything that if I'm tackling modernization. Which kind of architectural improvement comes for free? And this is what I mean if I'm taking a solution where somebody already had some thoughts about it that without investing any more money, I already get some parts that are included and I don't need to spend there because maybe today it's not my biggest requirement to have a data lineage, but I know that maybe in two or three years it could be worth to me. And this is what such an automated approach brings you. It brings you data lineage, documentation, and it brings you as well near real-time capabilities. And maybe today you say, yes, but that's no work for me today, but think in the time years perspective, it could be in the future. So if you have an architecture, if you know that there are APIs to trigger such kind of things and it comes for free, that's cool. Maybe you wouldn't pay extra today, but if you don't take this into consideration, you will have later on maybe some more costs to bear. Now the questions, why are we thinking that Data Vault Builder together with XSOL is a very good way of modernizing your data warehouse solution? So let's have a look on how the Data Vault Builder works on a layer perspective. So if you're going here from the staging area through our persistent core, through our dimension model, which could be as well more normalized or more completely flat into our data marts, and this is everything handled by, handled by the Data Vault Builder tool. But from the moment we end up here in staging, everything is built using ELT. This means we need a database which really performs well. And not only performs very well, but performs very well without having to maintain it. And this is the part that I very like about XSOL. It is self-tuning. It's you don't need to set any indexes or define any parameters or set some, I don't know, configuration flags. It just works out of the box. And in the case you have any questions or there are any features that you want to use, you are not sure why, there is a very good support for it. And these are the two components that we believe it makes it one of the best choices at all for such kind of processes. And as we heard before, based on the findings of, of the analyst is the fast database that you can use at all. So it will speed up as well your queries here. And this is in fact, probably the benchmark that you will have. Are the business users happy by getting the data correctly? That's what we are ensuring by proper modeling and are getting the users this data fast. Can they drill down in seconds down to the lowest grain? And are they happy? with the results they're getting. Maybe Carson, you wanna hear as well, add some points from your point of view. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, so I guess it, it really, as Peter says, it, stay, it starts on the left side with the data integration. And that's also maybe one of the, the strong points of Exosol. Uh, you can use X and with Data Wall Builder also, especially where you can, use Exosol to load, of course, flat files. I mean, that's, that's I would say, the basics in what databases should support in, in bulk loading, right? But uh, we support any other relational source. So if you have a SQL server, if you have an Oracle database or a Teradata warehouse, uh, maybe not the warehouse, but the, the Oracle DB2 database or MySQL, whatever, we can directly connect to that and pull in the data. And actually, the Data Vault Builder can leverage that basically do the staging, just grab the stuff that's there. If it's another API, if it's a, a, a different different system, you can also do this via the database. You can directly use it, use Data Vault Builder, but you can also go via the database and let the database connect, for example, to your Hadoop cluster and pick up the stuff that's in there and massively parallel, put it into the staging just to get the first fast data integration because the performance, of course, is not only important on the analytics side. So on the right side, what you have then in the data marts and your reporting tools, but especially also when it comes to data ingestion, because the quicker this process can be executed, 
the faster the people have the new data available and maybe you don't have to fall back into a daily load but can maybe update your database warehouse on a more frequent basis um, I guess the, the the stuff around business world that's and, and the dimensional models you will cover or do you want me to cover that but it's you're the most special Feel free to add for, for the time being and then go for, for, for another use case then yeah, okay. <laughs> okay so uh, one, one thing also that that and, and Peter will 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 uh, um, also confirm that probably is uh, when, when we when you have the core world as a physical model um, and then you start creating your dimensional models um, you can either go and copy the data and create that but what we su support and we recommend especially in the early stages uh, just virtualize that use views um, the database is performant as enough or is, it is performant so that you can actually run your queries on the dimensional models which is just implemented via views including the business rules of course depending on the data volumes that you have you might in some cases want to um, materialize that but in many cases these views are fully sufficient and um, what, what we did and Peter mentioned the, the implementation of version 7 this the special data type is that we created for example for data vault was the hash type I mean, the UIDs that you create, the, uh, the keys, usually UIDs typically stored as Varchar in a, in, a, in a database. And if you hear background noise, we just have a thunderstorm here. I, please excuse that. Uh, and, uh, but, but Varchar or character columns are not really uh, good when, when it comes to joins. And a data vault model by nature has many, many joins as you have many objects linked to each other. So we implemented the hash type, which is a bin binary data type which provides the same performance as if you would use a typical binary data type like a decimal for these UUIDs, a big decimal. Um, so we could dramatically improve the performance there. And that, again, enables people not to have to materialize the dimensional model, including the business rules, but actually can uh, use a virtualized approach. And with that, I hand back to you, Peter. And I can confirm that from the business perspective, what the benefit is, is that by creating this layers here, as we heard, at least in the first version, virtual, it means the changes are that simple. I mean, I can drag here in column, I can change stuff, I can select from other objects. I don't need to reload anything. I can just present to the business user as it will look like in the output. He can test it. And we have round trip cycles of a few minutes. And this makes it very, very simple to work here to get to the final output, maybe to do together with the business user, even a side by side session and, and figure out the last differences in an interactive session. Now, maybe one use case that I really like yesterday when we did the same webinar in German is the question was how comes Hadoop data in here like this? And this is where Exasol helps us. And we can say, okay, we can create here for your data that you want to bring through the model and link it then through Exasol virtually to different big data sources. And then you can do like query your customer data joining like your machine data to it. You don't need to pipe it through your data vault if it doesn't make sense and maybe just store aggregates in your data vault. One example of a client that we have that's doing something similar, they like doing research on humans or on, on, on treatments for humans. So they are just storing the human genome and they're not storing that in a database, they're storing it on a Hadoop system. They're just pulling in the relevant gene, gene sequences into the database, but keeping everything else out. But as soon as they figure out that they maybe want to look at other parts of the genome, they can just query it and bring it in very simply from their Hadoop system. And this kind of architecture that, that works very well together helps you, helps you to solve this kind of problems. And I want to as well simplify this picture a little bit maybe, which is how it looks like is in fact, we have certain source systems and you don't need to worry how to bring in different data sources. There are different ways to bring them in, into your data warehouse, which is based on a business model. All the technical stuff like historization, like creating tables and everything and creating a load is done automatically. You're covering use cases that you maybe haven't thought of, like how do you cover if somebody deletes stuff in your source system and doesn't inform you about this implicit de delete detection that's already covered automatically because we have standardized patterns and we know this problem will arise at some point in time. As well, delta loading is included, all this stuff. Next thing is we just can create here a model how to select data out of it. And here you can include as well 
maybe some power users into it. And as we have then a database interface on XSL level, all the different tools and maybe different tools over time as they are changing faster than the data warehouse solution can query the same data. And even if you have some Excel users as we have again and again, they're happy as well because they can connect directly to the XSL database and get blazing fast results into their Excel sheets. So I would put it, uh, I would keep it here and I would go now to question and answer section. And let me just here bring in my Q and A section and my chat section. And there was one question is, is it possible to import data model automatically into Git and export it? Um, and there are two answers to it. It is already possible with the current version, but I needed one additional tool for it. But with version six, which are currently releasing, there are REST API as well for this step. So it will be possible, or it is already possible now with version six to export models using a REST API, validate models using a REST API, compare two models and create a deployment script and to apply a deployment script. And this is one of the biggest features that we are right now releasing in version six. Okay, one question is about licensing. How does that work? And here, the thing is we, are, we have a very similar license model Then maybe Carson can, can uh, as well extend this, but we are looking mainly here, if you're working together with XSOL, what is the amount of your raw data? Based on that, we are versioning your production server. And for the data vault builder part, you get included as well the licenses for your test and development boxes. That's not exactly the same, I think, like with Exasol, but Carson can explain it. And the second thing is the number of developers. So if you want to get a quote, if you can tell us the number of overall data that you want to process plus the number of developers, we can give you a quote exactly for the data vault builder part. And Carson, you can maybe elaborate what you're needing, which kind of information. Right. So the XSL data model, uh, data model, the XSL <laughs> licensing model is actually very, very simple. It's just based, as Peter mentioned, on the raw data volume that is stored in the database. And that's independent of where you deploy it. It always ships all functionality. And uh, that's for the production system. The same is true for DEF and test, although these come heavily discounted. Um, so you just pay a small fraction. And uh, like like with Data Vault Builder, we, we have a test free test version also available. I think it's the same as you, Peter, but please correct me. Free test version available free for download. So if you want to get a first start, get a first look at it, um, you can just uh, download it from our website. Or um, if you're on Docker, um, on Docker Hub, you can also find the Exosol and, and play around with that. Or go to the public cloud providers, for example, AWS, Azure or Google. And there you will find us in the marketplace or alternatively use uh, cloudtools.xsol.com as an entry point to basically create your system um, in the cloud and, and use test it there. So that's that's the, the very simple um, licensing model of XSL. But very important. For test licenses, a little bit different because yes, even at the end, using the tool is very simple and you can include everybody there is some kind of a learning curve in the beginning. So what we are doing usually is to, to do with you a little workshop, we call this co-modeling sessions where we enable you in three hours to do your own stuff, where we can show as well the, the full development process in tool. And then usually we, we are giving you free POC licenses if you decide to do a POC with XSL database and one of our partners together that we give you a free license for this time period where you're executing your POC to test it really in your company and how you can use it. Yep. Good, uh, there's one question is, can data model builder generate ETL and ELT code as Informatica code? No, we don't need that. We don't need any external ETL or ELT tool because we are executing the code directly on database functionality. So we're taking out complexity. Can you still combine it with the data vault builder, uh, the Informatica approach? Yes, we have some customers in banking. They already use Informatica. They are already staging like the data 
into the database using Informatica and they don't, they don't want to change it, that's fine. We can pick it up from there. We have something called the intra database loader and we are dragging it then into our process. But then still we are not generating the staging process in Informatica, but we are, can connect them and on top of it. Then there is a question is, how do you propose that you start your project if you are starting this kind of data vault modernization approach? And the point is that we recommend in the meantime, based on the projects we did, that you first start with an IT driven project to maybe move the first like 20% of core business concepts, which are very crucial and which you need in every report, like the customer, like the product, and you already start to building up your environment. But you stop as soon as possible and you change then in the mode where it's business driven. So as soon as one of the departments want to have some changes on some existing objects in the data warehouse, that you move the related parts to the new environment. This can cover like 70% of your project. And at the end, you usually have a few entities left that you need to clean up where we say about 10% of the entities at the end could be it could be needed that there is an IT project as well at the end, cleaning up the old environment, turning it off, ensuring that everything is turned off properly. So this is a, a little bit of approach. Maybe Carsten, you want to add something to that? <clears throat> no, I guess um, the, 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 as you mentioned, the step-by-step the, the -step approach is, is start small and then grow big um, is, is probably the best, um, especially if this is a new approach to for the company to also you need to start learning how to best use these tools use these things and therefore in my opinion as well start small create quick wins because that's also important if, especially in, in such a project to create quick wins that you can then also show uh, to management right um to convince the stakeholders that this is the right approach and then move off, uh, onward from there and I mean, the, the tool allows you, or the tools allow you to step by step expand it. It's 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 a very easy and very flexible approach. Maybe related to this, how long does it take until you have the first output? And I would answer this in, in a two part answer. Is the first thing technically you can go through the all the layers and you are doing this in the live demonstrations within an hour if you know how to use the tool. How long does it take in the real world project? Uh, if we're doing proof of concepts, usually within a week of about three working days spread over five, five days, we manage to create like the first process, two or three dimensions, go through all the layers, create a first report, and refine again the data warehouse model already. So it's pretty fast, but we are starting with one environment, which most probably at the end will become the production environment. Maybe in a second sprint, we are adding the test box, then we are moving the development of the test box, deploying already to production, learn this in the second sprint. In the third sprint, we're adding like the development box and then we're going in the full ITIL conform process. Then maybe two or three developers come on board and we, we, we grow the team working with this setup and then slowly moving into a fully Git flow based process with sandboxes over time, maybe of two or three times period. But constantly, and this is what Karsten mentioned, we are producing from sprint one, the first output. And that's really important that you get as well the teams on board that the business users start working with you because you're giving them value from the beginning. Otherwise, it will get difficult to motivate them to go on, on the path with you and to, to go along your journey. Anything you want to add, Carsten? No, I think you summed it up perfectly. Very good. Good. Any more questions? I would say we would have time for one more question if there is anything. But it looks okay. So from my side, I want to say thank you. Thank you as well for the interesting questions. And if you're interested in see the tool in action together with Exasol, please contact me or Karsten. We do regular live demonstrations about weekly uh, where we can really show you how this works together, how fast it is, how really you go in a few minutes through all the layers. And it can be interesting for you as a potential company that wants to use 
the tool and the database, but as well for potential partners, because we have as well combined partners, because we are creating a technical solution, but to implement the whole process, to enable our clients, we are working as well with a lot of BI consultancies. So if you are one of these BI consultancies now in this call, please feel free to contact us. We have both partner programs where we would like to enable you to use our tools. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So I see if you are on time, that's good. Then thank you to everybody for joining. And if you wanna watch this video again, our sales uh, people will send you just a link to the recording as a last thing for, for contact. And if you have any interest, please contact us and we're happy to help you. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much also from my side and have a great rest of the day or evening. Thank you. Perfect. Bye. Thank you. Bye.